good evening, uh, everyone. Thank you very much for joining me uh, uh, on this uh, talk uh, with uh, PO in, uh, in this evening. Thank you for coming uh, and joining me this evening. Thank you very much. Hopefully, uh, we will cover as, as, as much as we can, but uh, I want to take this opportunity to thank all uh, the followers who followed us during the PNC uh, convention, recent convention, uh, which was uh, an eye-opener for many, uh, including ourselves, who were organizing the event. Very lively discussions about few policies that uh, came out of uh, uh, those uh, discussions that took place in the convention. I want to thank all the participants, uh, especially uh, those who have followed me uh, and followed the convention uh, uh, live on, on, on social media. Uh, that has been a, uh, a new thing in PNG and, and you have been part of that and I hope that uh, it will pick up momentum for many other organizations to engage with the public. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, public debates on key issues that is affecting uh, our country and, and, and what we can do for our country. Also, I want to thank many uh, of our supporters right throughout the country who have uh, joined me on many of my trips. Uh, we, are, uh, we have been well received and, and, uh, and, and the uh, opportunity to discuss uh, Again, some of the issues around the country, policies, uh, the upcoming elections, uh, that has been uh, an eye-opener for myself and some of the leaders that has, have been traveling with me. Uh, we have enjoyed those discussions immensely, and the support that we are getting uh, right throughout the country is encouraging and, and, and in many cases uh, overwhelming. So uh, I, I want to thank uh, each and every one of you who have uh, who've joined us on those occasions. But uh, just coming back to the policies, I know we are heading towards the elections. Uh, elections are now a few days away for the writs to be issued. Uh, I hope that the Electoral Commissioner is ready. Uh, I hope that they could be more engaged with the public, informing the public on the status of the preparations and uh, how they are going on uh, to to counter some of the concerns that the public have uh, in terms of their preparations, security, voting, uh, and, and some of the apprehension that the candidates and, of course, the voters have uh, uh, for, for these elections. Uh, this is a very important election uh, for the country. We are going to uh, approach 50 years of independence uh, in 2025. As we transition to the next 50 years, uh, these elections need to become the foundation on which uh, future leaders can build on the uh, uh, progress that uh, we have made in the last 50 years and, 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 and where the country is today. So it is quite an important election and the people must have their say uh, and, and people must vote freely without undue influence and, 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 and with undue encouragement that uh, sometimes are reported in some parts of the country. Generally, we, we are very happy that uh, the, the elections are around many, many electorates in the country. More than probably 95% of the electorates in the country have, have gone smoothly in the past. Uh, but, uh, you know, on, in one or two electorates uh, in, in some parts of the country have been of, of, of a major concern. I, I think the Electoral Commission and the Security Forces should focus on making sure that uh, those uh, areas there is history of some disturbance and where people are intimidated and voters are intimidated. I think uh, you know, that's where we should be beefing up uh, our, our uh, support so that uh, our people can vote freely. Uh, of course, every party that goes to the election wants a better outcome and uh, PNC is the same. Uh, we want to uh, make sure that we win enough numbers to try and govern alone. I think it's important for the country to learn some very important lessons over the last 47 or 40, uh, 46 years. And, and that is that our country has been, been uh, stifled by the progress in the development agenda that we have for the country because of uh, political instability that has continued to uh, 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 sort of uh, uh, been with us since uh, 1975 uh, and, and the uh, first word of no confidence in 
uh, right after five years after the independence. And, uh, and that has not been good for the country. Uh, this constant instability is a result of uh, so many small parties and so many independents getting to go into parliament and managing uh, smaller parties and little groups uh, is not easy for anybody who's in government, whether it is PNC or Pangu or whether it's NA or anyone else for that matter, PDM. It has always been a constant challenge. So I, I encourage our voters to make the right selections and make a clear mandate. You know, if, if, if some of our people who are in, on the opposite of us have been mandated, so be it. But uh, it has to be uh, mandated properly to a to, to govern well and, and then we can hold that particular party to account for its actions. Sometimes when, when we have governments that are made out of so many coalitions and so many partners, we have a situation where we are busy managing politics, trying to maintain stability of a government, and, and sometimes we forget the priority of managing the country on behalf of the people. And uh, we have experienced that when we were in government, and I'm sure uh, at present, uh, present government is facing similar challenges, and previous governments uh, have also faced similar challenges. So, uh, going to an election, uh, get, getting the policy uh, platforms for each of the parties, feel comfortable with what they are what they are putting forward to the nation, uh, that they are able to achieve what they are saying they will, uh, and, and and elect uh, the leaders on basis of that. So I, I think it is an important election. We cannot continue to make the same mistakes over and over again. And uh, that is why PNC has gone about drafting the, the policy framework that we believe that uh, uh, can be able to improve the standard of living for our people, improve on the delivery of services, the quality of infrastructure, uh, health and education are the key to the uh, key cornerstone of, the, of that policy. Uh, platform that we are driving for the nation and the message is slowly getting out there and uh, we are encouraging all our candidates right across the country uh, to to uh, to ensure that they are able to uh, understand the plan that we have the vision that we have and if, if we uh, are fortunate enough to form government we want to make sure that uh, those are the promises that we make to the nation collectively it's not a promise that is made by one or two individuals, but we are doing it so collectively so that we can take ownership and then drive the uh, policy uh, platforms that we have uh, and, and try and get the best outcomes uh, for our people. So it is important to, to do that. Uh, we have got uh, an economy that is not functioning well, and one of our key priorities uh, in, in a uh, PNC is to make sure that we make sure our economy goes back to a growth uh, path where over the last uh, three years especially, we have had record deficit budgets. Uh, although we have also had deficit budgets in the past, we have tried our best to limit it down to an average of 3% uh, per, per annum. But uh, uh, in the, uh, on the case of the last three years, it's averaging over 6% per annum, which is double the, uh, the deficit levels that has been uh, in, in the past. Uh, that is of a huge concern because uh, those deficits uh, have got to be funded by borrowings and that started in 2019 when we uh, lost government in April uh, uh, the new government came in and and of course the the, the ended with a 4.172 billion kina deficit now we had to borrow 4.12 billion kina to cover that shortfall that means we spent more than what we had in, in terms of revenue and grants and in 2020, it further increased. Uh, this was well before COVID and all the other events that took place, which we continuously seem to be blaming uh, the, uh, the performance of the economy, lackluster performance of the economy too. Uh, and then in 2020, uh, we had uh, almost 7.3 billion kina worth of uh, uh, deficit. And uh, again, that increased from 4.1 to 7.3. Uh, almost eventually doubled in the sense that uh, you know it, it, it's getting closer to eight eight billion kina, and you have to borrow that eight billion kina to fund the expenditures that the uh, uh, the government has uh, has put forward uh, to, to to as part of its expenditure plan. 
And then, of course, in 2021, we just uh, found out that uh, it has been almost 6.2, 6.3 billion kina again. Now, when you look at those numbers alone, it's already close to 18 billion kina in three years. You have to borrow money to fund your budget. And, and that, is the, that is why the, the size of the deficit is blowing up. And, and when you spend that kind of money, that is on top of the uh, revenues and grants that you have received. So on average, about 10 billion kina. So on top of the 10 billion you are spending, on average, another 5 or 6 billion kina a year. Uh, the, the spending of that magnitude is not reflecting on, on the progress of the country's economy or creation of jobs, uh, delivery of services like health and education. All these sectors are suffering but our government continues to spend. So we, you know, we will really have to examine the books, examine the government accounts to see where has all these funds has been diverted to. Uh, and the concern is that the government today is, uh, as we speak, is continuously writing checks. Uh, uh, Bulupindi House, the Finance Department and Treasury Department is almost on overdrive. Overdrive in, in, in writing checks on, on projects that are not being procured well. This is not just average de delivery of services to health and education and, and maintenance of government basic services, but this is to projects and contractors and, 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 and people, uh, in some cases, some token uh, companies that are fake companies who have never existed, never had history of uh, uh, operation in PNG, have been given contracts out into the millions of Kina. And all these funds have been uh, has been expended, and, and nothing to show for it. And and we can't continue to maintain that kind of expenditure levels, uh, whilst our our services are declining. We have not paid school fees in 2019, 2020, 2021. Uh, we don't know the figures of the 2022 will be, but I can guarantee you that given the election year, the blowout will be even worse. And, and we will be in a much bigger uh, hole than, uh, and, than we are currently in. So we are very concerned about the stability of the economy right after the elections. We need to take stock of where we are. We need to take stock of uh, uh, these non-priority expenditures that are taking place, especially in projects that are not going to build the economy or to, to able to sustain the growth of the economy. Uh, this needs to be reviewed. And uh, we will we will embark on that immediately as soon as uh, uh, if we are given the opportunity to uh, form government. I, I think our our uh, government has uh, tried its best uh, in the sense that uh, they think that the continuity of uh, some of the uh, expenditure levels are going to uh, improve services, but it's not translating to that. Our health services have declined, and many hospitals uh, on a daily basis are struggling to have medicine in the uh, hospitals basic equipment. This is basic medicine, basic equipment. And in some cases, health workers are not paid, so the Australian government is paying those for us. Uh, as a, a sovereign country, independent country, this is not something that we want to encourage, where we need foreign donors and foreign uh, governments to come and help us fund our day-to-day -day operational expenses, uh, which we can, we can do it ourselves. So in terms of the economy, we need to get the economy moving again. And one way to do is we've got to give back confidence, government confidence back into the investment community and the business community. Government has got limited opportunity to create space for employment for our people in the country. The only growth area that can provide employment for all our citizens and most of our citizens is through, through the growth of the private sector. Uh, we've had zero foreign direct investment in the country over the last three years, zero. Despite talks going on with big investors, most of these investors are waiting and seeing because they can see a government that is erratic, not consistent with its uh, decisions, uh, and, and making decisions on the run. When you make a commitment to an international company or international organization that is committing billions and billions of kina, of their shareholders' money or government's money into our country, they need firm commitment from the government of the day. And unfortunately, our, our government has not been able to provide that confidence. So we've had zero foreign direct investment in the country. And as a result, 
uh, many of our companies and those who are already existing in the country are cutting back on the cost of, uh, of, of, of operations in the country. And the first people who suffer most uh, are our people who get uh, sacked from the jobs because they're trimming costs. Every company in the country is, is cutting back. And that's why we are saying that our focus is recreating jobs by giving confidence back into the business and keeping a government that is going to keep its word when you are able to uh, uh, sign, a, sign an agreement, you are signing on behalf of the independent state of our country. You cannot change it. It doesn't matter whether the government changes tomorrow or, uh, or the next year. Those decisions have been made already and consistency must flow on. Unless they are illegal, they breach the constitution or they breach the laws of our country, then you have every right to review those agreements. But if they comply with all the requirements and legal requirements and, and our officials and state officials have given the necessary legal clearance, we have no choice but to, uh, to accept that uh, this is a legally binding agreement. So we need to restore the investor confidence and, and of course get some of the uh, projects that are now uh, has been stalled and despite many promises, despite many promises, many of these investments are now on hold. We now know Papua LNG, Pinyang, Wafi Golpu, Pogara, all these projects are on hold until after the elections you will see that the investors will start talking to government. And, and, and suddenly, uh, if uh, uh, the current government continues to maintain the same position, if they get government, you can see further delays or some of the investors will walk away from it because they've got investment opportunities in other countries all around the world. We are competing for the same investment dollar. The only way to create jobs is to make sure that these investors come in and we make sure our Papua New Guineans are employed and they can be able to earn an income and, and, and look after their families. And this is uh, where we can be uh, able to uh, uh, try and rebuild and the, the, the growth of our economy. The second issue about the economy is that we need to focus on our strengths, what we have best, like agricultural fisheries. We need to get back to in, improve productivity in these areas, uh, forestry, uh, tourism. We need to improve productivity, make sure the number of people coming into the country is increased, they're looked after, uh, and, and, and the exports, or even feeding our own population in agriculture. Uh, agriculture is going to become, a, and feeding of our population is going to become a big priority for any government in the future. So we need to invest heavily into that. And that is going to create thousands and thousands of jobs, uh, hundreds of thousands of jobs. Uh, not only because they are self-employed, and or if, if they are employed by big, large investments uh, that are made in that sector, particularly in agriculture. Uh, that is why we are very uh, committed to rebranding re the uh, National Development Bank. We know the uh, inefficiencies and the uh, red tape and all the political interference that goes into the National Agriculture uh, Development Bank, which is stifling the uh, ability of that organization to deliver to our expectations. So we have to cut right through it, uh, restructure it, bring private sector in, bring very competent people to come in and manage it, and government puts funding in there so that it can be lent at very, very low interest rates. We want to lend it at uh, very low interest, uh, less than 3 or 4 percent uh, on average over 20, 30 years, so that agricultural projects get started and they are not under pressure from day one. They don't have a cash flow problem from day one, so that they are given opportunity to grow and, and have st stability in their businesses and they are able to have enough income so that they can repay this loan over, over 20 or 30 years. These are our people. They are not going to run away to another country with loans still outstanding to us. They must be, but they must be given the opportunity to grow their businesses. And this is the only way uh, and that we need to mobilize the land, work with the landowners and our customary landowners to, they've already got a big asset that they can utilize. And in many parts of the world, many people don't have land. But they want to get into SMEs, they've got to rent land, they've got to go and build infrastructure, and then start up a business. Whereas in Papua New Guinea, we already have land. 
we just have to translate that into making sure that it works for our people who own the land, our people who can get into SMEs, uh, particularly in agriculture. Uh, and my, uh, uh, my, our government's aim is to move some of these key departments, like agriculture. We are going to move it into places like Hagen, uh, where we can uh, develop the Wagi Valley, which is a very fertile land. They are sitting here in Port Mosby, and we have no agricultural field here in Mosby. They're just wasting everybody's time. So the entire department should be moved up there. There should be just an agent small office here to manage the regulatory and legislative issues that may arrive, arise here. But the, the actual office to work and develop agriculture should be moved up there. The National Agriculture and SME Bank should be moved out of Port Mosby and moved over to to, 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 the, to Lay or Goroka or Hagen somewhere there so that we will be able to be closer to our customers. They're not sitting down here where they are far away and every time they want to borrow money, if somebody has to fly into Port Mosby, waste money, go back, put in the application, come back and chase the applications. All these inefficiencies that keep on frustrating our people and builds costs must be stopped so that we can have our people start businesses with a, a much easier way to approach businesses. Uh, I know this very well because you know I, have, I'm, I come from a small business environment. I started my business 35 years ago when I left university and I went to Goroka and started a small store and built my businesses from there onwards. So uh, I know what I'm talking about, the frustrations that uh, uh, dealing with Port Mosby and Waigani uh, brings to a person who is in a remote area. So we need to make it easier for them to start business and, 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 and of course that will translate into jobs. Jobs for families, wife and husband working together, their kids joining them. Now this is a trend that is happening all around the world and Papua New Guinea, we are not capturing this. And I think uh, for many, uh, many times in, 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 you know, we've put bits and pieces of intervention. You know, we've put two, three hundred million, eighty million, hundred million, and, and that's not solving the problem. We've just been running around in circles. So what we are saying is we'll chuck in close to 500 million kina every year into this sector so we can keep lending money to our people and they can. And this is only for Papua New Guineans only. This is for indigenous businesses. And we need to make sure that we build this uh, population up to, to translate that, that uh, into a better uh, standard of living and employment opportunities is for them. The, the other issue is that, as, as I said, even with agriculture, we will move agriculture out of Port Mosby. We move fisheries to places like Medane or Kokopo or Cavian or Manus or you know, possibly to Medane. The industrial, commerce and industry, to build the industrial centers, we move them down to Ley. And of course, we uh, move tourism. We need to move into places like Kokopo or Medane or somewhere there. So where there is an opportunity to build a big industry, we must move our departments and government offices to be close to those industries and drive the growth of those industries. And this is where when we commit 500,000 jobs in five years, I think we will exceed that. I, I am very confident that we will exceed that. But I am saying that that is the minimum amount of jobs I, any government must create. And, and the only way we can know that, that has been, is when we have the economy growing, and we have had the economy growing for the, uh, from 2002 to 2019 uh, without fail for, uh, for 18, 19 years. And, and, and that has translated into growth of many, many businesses and job opportunities for many Papua New Guineans. All we have done is created an environment where investment opportunities are not even available. Many, many Papua New Guineans even own businesses are holding back investment in expanding their current businesses because they lack the confidence in government. Government interference, government put in unnecessary uh, legislation to, to curb certain industries because they are either jealous or uh, they, they are envious. Uh, sometimes they don't like uh, uh, the business leaders who are in there because they are associated with certain people. This kind of immature way of uh, running a nation and immature way of making decisions must stop. Because these people are creating jobs for our citizens. They are paying taxes and they are investing in our country, investing in long-term investment. When they make buildings and when they build infrastructure, they can't pack up and leave tomorrow. They are committed to our nation for many, many years. 
Uh, and that's why we need to work together to uh, uh, make sure that we promote these very important sectors like agriculture, forestry, fisheries, tourism. These are, these are uh, job creators for the country. They are wealth creators for the country. And to SME and Farmers Bank that we are, uh, we have committed to 2023. First day, we must have a retail banking license. There's no more excuses. We've been telling Agri National Development Bank to get a retail banking license so that Papua New Guineans who are lining up on queues at ATM, they don't have to line up there. They can go to their bank and they don't have to be asked questions continuously like criminals uh, as, as, as about who they are and what their identity is when they want to open an account or when they want to transact. Uh, that is why it is important that we create an institution in banking and financial services that is going to serve our people and they can have access to this capital that uh, they are now not able to, the access to credit they are not able to so that they can either expand their businesses or, or of course of course, build new businesses. So uh, I, I think that is the way to go. We've talked about also uh, an housing policy where we said we're committed to building at least 5,000 houses uh, per annum. I have, uh, I have uh, been in, in politics for almost 20 years now. This will be my 20th year. And I have uh, been part on, of course, uh, I've seen uh, many housing programs that start and come and go. And it, it has certainly been a failure. So when we got into government, uh, you know, we tried a few housing schemes, it didn't work. And then we allocated 200 million kina, which we part with BSP. And today, uh, thousands of Papua New Guineans are borrowing money from there. Uh, a, a top limit of 400,000 kina per year at 4% fixed interest rate for 40 years. So give them a real chance so that they are not, their repayment to the loan is very small, but gives them a real chance to be able to afford to build a house, buy a house, and, and, and live in a house that they can own over time. And of course, that can be passed from generation to generation, but it is a home for Papua New Guineans. So that is a success that uh, our partnership with BSP has uh, been able to deliver. But uh, still, the demand is very high, and a lot of Papua New Guineans are still missing out. That is why we are saying that we will be committed to engaging with private sector, but we want to see real outcomes of affordable houses at affordable prices, where the state will be able to enable uh, f funding for them to borrow for over an extended period of time, so each individual take ownership of those houses. So it is a public housing program that we want to develop and deliver around the country. Uh, I think it is uh, achievable because I don't like to see our people slipping and going and building houses and squatter settlements uh, popping up everywhere. It, it is, uh, firstly, uh, the quality of life is not good. There's no water and sanitation. There's no electricity. All this and water and all those things that are basic necessity to uh, a good quality of life it's not there. That is why our people are sick, they're not uh, healthy enough, and they're not productive. It's because of a lack of, uh, of poor housing and poor, uh, uh, poor living standards that they are now, now living in. We need to break that cycle. I always say to a lot of people when I meet them that, you know, one thing, uh, places like China has, has taught the, the world, not only Papua New Guinea, but the world, is that we need to study where they have moved four or five hundred million people, four or five hundred million people from poverty to middle class. Now, there is an example that we can translate in a much smaller scale, but in PNG it's doable. And, and that is through mainly by making sure that they have got good quality housing and, and have access to power and water and sanitation. And we have a program with uh, our development partners, Australia, Japan, New Zealand, and, uh, and United States. We have given us almost 5.6 billion kina uh, as part of the APEC uh, package that they uh, assistance to PNG, which is still available, but we are not translated. We are not organized enough to have access to that funding to enable this, uh, this housing and water and sanitation and power projects that will improve the quality of life in PNG for our citizens. And this is where we are now uh, going to forcefully drive it. 
And I'm, I'm certain that if we put a very workable and a doable proposition to our development partners, they will come on board. And we will develop this with them so that there is absolute transparency in the way we deliver uh, uh, an, 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 an accountable way we deliver this large sum of money. It is not a loan, it is a grant, and it is unfortunate not taking advantage of it. We've wasted three years, and Papua New Guineans are still living the same style, living, living style, living standards uh, that, that they've been doing for many, many years, and that is, that is not what we want in our country. So we've got some very interesting uh, in, in policies that I've touched and I'm quite happy to uh, continue discussing with them and I will answer a few questions uh, in, in a few minutes. But as I said, our economy, we have a serious problem. Uh, the Treasurer, in the last session of Parliament, when they had a, uh, a lengthy session of Parliament, uh, which was uh, absolutely unnecessary, but you know, put in uh, legislation, even one of their coalition partners, National Alliance, come out and say that uh, they are uh, very opposed to the idea of pushing last minute legislation and laws that is going to save personal interest. Now, what, what has happened has happened. I'm certain that the new government coming in will review all those legislations to make sure that uh, they have been done in the best interest of the country. And as part of uh, that sitting, the Treasurer. Uh, again submitted the uh, final budget uh, outcomes uh, late again he uh, did it in april he's supposed to do it on 31st of uh, 31st of um, uh, march but every year he has failed to meet those deadlines required by law and he had a 15 or 16 page speech and in any economic statement of any government one of the key issues apart from revenue and expenditure and deficit and, and, and the policies that will drive the economy and, and, and be, uh, bring about stability in the economy uh, is also a, uh, a statement on the level of debt that the country has. Every statement since uh, independence has, has captured that. But unfortunately, our treasurer has conveniently uh, excluded that in his statement. And the numbers came out late, and we have to go around looking for it in international organizations like IMF and World Bank through their uh, websites to try and uh, put together a, a, a statement on our own country. Uh, what's happening to our own economy, which is uh, supposed to be a public uh, document for public consumption. Uh, this kind of uh, trickery uh, is, is unnecessary. Uh, we need to tell the country where we are. We need to take ownership of the decisions that we make, and uh, I am certain that uh, uh, in a, in a public will understand. But uh, we continue to blame others for the things that go wrong, trying to take credit for what is rightfully uh, not their making, and, uh, and, and, and continue to make uh, promises to the nation uh, that you can't deliver. Uh, it's impossible to deliver, uh, and knowing very well that it's not going to be delivered, they make promises because it sounds nice and it's conveniently told so that they can influence people's uh, decisions in the upcoming elections. This is wrong, and I want to uh, assure everybody, this election is not about who becomes prime minister or which party gets into government. It is about you. It's about your family. It's about your children. It's about your job. It's about the quality of life you want to uh, have. It's about the cost of living and the prices that are going up in the country for everything, every consumer item, from food to fuel to kerosene to cooking oil. You know, prices on average uh, from 10 to 25 percent on many of these items are going up in, in, every, every month or so, and there's no control. And this is the problem that we are facing, and, 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 and governments need to be uh, able to uh, to tell the nation the true state of affairs of the economy, true state of the accounts of the government, and so that everybody can put our thoughts into it. Even if we have to criticize, we try to criticize in a constructive manner, giving suggestions as to how they can address uh, and, 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 and take charge of the issues and the challenges that we have in forward. So I, I think governments, uh, not only this government, but governments in the future, uh, must be able to take ownership of decisions. Not every decision a government makes is right all the time. 
Uh, this is because the circumstances are different. When you're making those decisions, at that time, you think it is the right decision. But when other factors come into play, uh, then the decision does not produce the results that we want. Uh, the, some of our leaders conveniently walk away from those decisions. Uh, and this is not a sort of leadership that we want in this country, where people continuously uh, deny responsibility uh, but continuously want to be worshipped, and 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 and, uh, and, uh, and that is that is wrong. Uh, so I, I think this election is 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 a good opportunity for many of us who are now uh, in a generation where we are going to move on. Uh, for the next generation, we need to lay down the right uh, set of policies that will drive uh, the economy and the, of course improve the standard of living for our people, reduce cost of living, and, and, and bring some stability uh, in, 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 in the, in the uh, climate of uh, investments and, of course, working conditions in the country. Uh, with those few words, uh, we'll continue to take questions, but uh, uh, when we said that we'll have this uh, talk tonight, uh, there's been uh, uh, questions that came through uh, questions and comments that came through, uh, uh, I think it's important that uh, I answer them and, and we can be able to uh, continue uh, engaging on it as we, as we go forward. One of the interesting is a lot of you asked about uh, uh, when I'm PNC is going to announce its candidates. Uh, what we are doing in PNC is, is, is uh, fairly simple. Uh, we have identified and uh, uh, PNC has received over 2,500 plus applications for uh, endorsement by PNC. Uh, there is uh, only about 118 seats as we speak today uh, uh, to be endorsed in Parliament. So we were overwhelmed by the uh, number of applications that we have received. Uh, as I've explained uh, at the convention and as, I, as I'm telling you tonight, uh, we are not able to accommodate everybody. But those who have been selected, uh, we have uh, now notified them that they are now been endorsed as the uh, party's uh, candidate for a particular seat. And those candidates have now responded back and we are filling the necessary forms that are required to be submitted to the electoral commission. And, and then by next week, uh, I will be publishing uh, in the newspapers and, and on, on this site and of course uh, PNC's own website the full listing of all the candidates uh, that are going to be uh, running with us. Why we are doing this is that uh, we don't want to publish uh, an announced candidates listing and then just before the reach are issued and the nominations take place, these candidates are, uh, have been uh, uh, scouting somewhere else and they want to move to other. We have to respect that. If they want to move to another party or if they want to run as an independent, uh, that's a choice that each individual can make. So we have to respect that they are comfortable with us, they, they are comfortable with PNC's policies, and that we are going to go to the elections together. One thing I want to assure you is this. Uh, what I've learned over the last three and a half years, uh, it has been a, a learning experience, it has been painful, but it has been a learning experience, uh, is that uh, I have analyzed uh, all these people who have been associated with me in one way or another in the formation of our government and my dealings with them over the last 20 years. We have seen each and every one of them, uh, how they have committed, whether they are committed to the party or to the nation or to each other, or there is a level of loyalty that we need to express to each other. Now, given that, uh, we've come to realizing that we are now going to have a, a very clean start PNC wants to have a clean start. We want to put a team of people who believe in the course of the policies that we are trying to deliver for the nation. We don't want to have candidates and people who are joining us for the sake of just saying, oh, we are now going to form government, so we have to go and join this team. Uh, we want to have believers in, in our cause, and that's why we are very committed into seriously uh, scrutinizing each applicant and making sure that we don't repeat some of the mistakes we have made in the past. We want to have a quality of leadership that is principally there to serve, make sure that the welfare of our people is number one priority, 
and the commitment to the party to deliver the policies that we are promising together to the nation. This promise is not only from the party leader or deputy party leader or individual leaders. It is a collective policy promise to the nation. We are making this commitment that we are going to deliver this and that's what I want every one of us to strive to work towards. And that is why the announcements are uh, 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 taking long to announce but uh, there is no timeline for this. So please be uh, understanding, appreciate uh, uh, the manner in which we are scrutinizing and uh, doing it with a lot of respect, uh, making sure that we don't embarrass anybody and, and put their names up without their consent. And when they are ready, we are going to go and publish each and every individual candidate uh, right across the country. I also want to say that there are one or two seats in the country where uh, there are uh, quite a number of candidates in that seat. They only want to run with PNC. As I said, I'm sorry, but you know, the law only allows PNC to select one. So I hope that uh, candidates and their supporters and everyone understand that. Uh, it doesn't mean that because we select one to run because of the law that we are not able to work together. Uh, if you believe in the policies, let's find a way to work together and you know, the, every voter has got the preference of three. So uh, let's utilize those preferences and make sure we, we, are, we work accordingly. So in terms of uh, announcements of the candidates, uh, certainly it will be done well before, uh, a few days before the uh, reach issued. And uh, we've already got uh, a majority of our candidates have already uh, uh, signed up the necessary forms and, 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 and responded to the acceptance. Uh, we are clearing them step by step to uh, make that announcement. <coughs> uh, the next issue is about uh, the pogo and uh, extractive, uh, extractive industries. There's been uh, question by, uh, questions by uh, Nelly uh, uh, and Dickie and Alex uh, uh, Aleka, uh, what are they saying that why is the real, what is the real cause of the delay of the Pogora mine and the opening of the mine? Well, we can only tell you what we see in the press and what we hear of the discussions that are going on. But I think there is a mismatch on the expectations of the landowners and the provincial government and the state on one side and of course the developers uh, and the uh, project operators, Barrick and, and, and their shareholders on the other side. And the mismatch is about a few things. One is uh, the uh, uh, SML, uh, the mining lease is uh, on expiration, the state without uh, following due process is allocated to uh, Kumul uh, mining and, uh, and, and now Barrick cannot op ever, uh, uh, from what I understand is that the Barrick cannot operate a mine without the proper SML being in their custody to enable them to run the mine. And secondly, of course, every day the delay cost, the cost of reopening the mine continues to increase. Uh, from the conservative estimates we are getting in this, uh, that it is now well over one billion kina. And if the state is going to get a majority shareholder in that would mean that the state has to pay over 500 million kina to Pogora to reopen the mine. And getting such amount of money is not easy either. So uh, uh, it's just a, uh, a, 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 a unfortunate that our leaders have made a, a, a rushed decision. Uh, I've put out a, a, a statement in the uh, dailies recently of the actual cost to the nation. Uh, and, uh, and, and I've researched this and, and, and made sure that I had a very conservative data that will give us the bottom basic uh, uh, numbers that will that the country has missed over almost to GDP about 9.3 billion kina in the last two years. Now this is when the oil gold prices are at its highest and continues to remain so at this moment and the mine remains closed. So we are, will continue to build on that over the, over the course of this year, uh, we'll probably put another 4.5 billion kina on top of it or more. So you will end up losing the GDP growth of the nation will be now uh, uh, missed by another 4.5 billion, taking it up to say 14 billion kina. Now that is quite a substantial amount of money for a small country like PNG. 
Uh, on top of that, you look at the jobs that has been over 3,500 direct jobs in the mine, and then the jobs, the thousands of jobs, drivers and all the other associated companies that service the mine. Uh, we're talking into probably 10,000 plus jobs that have been indirect jobs that have been lost to Pogra. So all these things, as well, the delays continue, the, 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 the reality is that the, the difficulty in reopening the mine continues to grow. So someone needs to come in and, and, and say enough is enough, uh, let's start the work, let's start the mine operating. Uh, there was no thinking process when they made the initial decision. Uh, they thought that it was easy, that you can just walk in and take over anything. Well, it doesn't operate like that in the real world. So uh, I think it's important to note that uh, uh, you can uh, you can be assured that it will be it'll get more and more difficult as the year year progresses, and and that will become the similar story we are facing in Panguna, where after all these years, even after the peace agreement, and now we are have a, a autonomous government on Bougainville, the, there is certainly difficulties in reopening the mine. But we are not learning from that history. We are just allowing things to uh, just uh, get out of hand and, and think that that is okay. Well, it's not okay. It's hurting a lot of families and a lot, lot of businesses and hurting the country. Uh, Alex, uh, again, asked uh, the Marabu government has injected uh, 30 million kina to 30 million kina to Pogra. Uh, so for, uh, in February for Wafi Golpu infrastructure development and relocation of the landowners. Two comments. Uh, it, it said there is no such development taking place. Uh, what is this view? Well, you know, Marabu government unfortunately has got a habit of just pushing checks around and making commitments everywhere, thinking that money will solve all, all the problems. Uh, well, that's certainly not true. It's not going to work that way. You know that uh, you need to sit down and have a long-term an arrangement with all the landowners and their benefits that they are going to get properly documented so that they are able to uh, to deliver uh, on these projects. Uh, government has made promises that it can't keep. And uh, I, unfortunately, I can say that uh, uh, Wafi is now in the same problem that Pogra is facing. Pogra, without any income, uh, Marape government has promised uh, almost 100 million kina to the landowners and, and the provincial government, Enga provincial government, 100 million kina. I think from what I hear, 40 million kina has been paid already. Now, I'm not saying that uh, landowners and Pogra or the, the provincial government do not deserve such a payment. All I'm saying is, is there's no income from Pogra to pay for such thing. But all the rest of the taxpayers in the country at the expense of our health and education and all the other expenses and basic services that we are supposed to provide, we are pulling the 100 million kina out and paying there when the issues are still remain unresolved. And, uh, and so many visits down to the Governor General's uh, house to sign all these agreements, I mean, and we're making Governor General become a laughing stock. Uh, his, you know, his signature should be worth something, it, a finality of something that you are getting things moving along. But uh, uh, today you can just take any paper down there and sign it any time you want to. So uh, uh, we, need to be, uh, we need to be serious about this. Uh, we also have um, uh, Philomena Aruma saying that uh, what sort of changes that, uh, what, what is uh, PNC's policy on the extractive, extractive industry? Considering the changes that are made by uh, uh, by the current government, well, I mean, the current government has made a lot of talk, but uh, in terms of the legislative uh, and uh, arrangements and changes, it, it hasn't changed much. Uh, the new uh, mining act has been in discussion for a long, long time. It's not uh, put forward uh, yet. Uh, they are trying to. Uh, develop some of the existing projects under the old mining act and then they're saying that we, that we will develop the new mining act under the uh, the new um, arrangements when it uh, comes into law uh, there's a lot of confusion going on so we need to get back and sit down and say listen this is the issues that we need to resolve let's have a, a clear understanding the investors coming here are not here to 
just do business for us and say, you take all the benefits and we'll put all the money in there. We have to appreciate that they're here to make money. They're here to make money. Our job as leaders and our job as a country is to maximize our benefit for our people, our country and our, our, our landowners. So when they say that uh, they're going to maximize the, uh, uh, the participation, it comes at a cost. So we need to value the cost. When are we going to start getting this? So in some of the negotiations that we have been doing when we were in government with like WAFI, we increased the development levy and, uh, and the royalty levies. Even though they were 2%, we increased it up to 3% each. So we increased it from 4% to 6%. That's a 50% increase. But that is trying to increase the cash flows coming directly to the landowners and provincial governments uh, as quickly as possible. Rather than waiting 10 years after the cost of constructions and, and, and the cost of constructions and cost of uh, operations are deducted and when all the loans are repaid, that's when we start benefiting from the projects and our people's demand is today about services is today, infrastructure is today. We need to find a solution to that. We've come up with a policy saying that in totality for any development, 51% percent plus percent uh, percentage of uh, the inflow of uh, revenue and, and benefits to that project must be for the benefit of Papua New Guinea. That's what we have stated. That's the guiding factor that will go no less 51% percent plus. So uh, that is how we are going to uh, approach and try and consolidate, but there must be clarity in the legislation that is before us. Uh, she also asked uh, Phil Philemon, oh, sorry, he almost he also asked about 500,000 jobs. Uh, he is saying that when you're in power, you didn't create this. Uh, are you going to create another 500,000 jobs? Well, when we were in power, as you know, the economy was growing from as I said 2002 when Somalia was in in power all the way up to 2019, the economy was growing. When the economy was growing, there was employment in the uh, industries, private sector, government, uh, the economy was thriving, so more and more people were employed. Uh, the only issue that we have in the country is we do not have a data collection system to tell us how many jobs were created, who is employed and who is not employed. So our aim is, in, as we have committed at the convention, in 2023, 23, because what we are committed to is we want to also put government funding directly to the wards, directly to the allergies, directly to the health centers, directly to the schools, directly to the health facilities, funding directly from national government to those facilities. In order for us to have a fair distribution of those resources, we must have actual population data. So that is why in 2023, we will start the national census. So we will take provincial governments and the districts to take ownership of the identification of each individual in each village. That data will determine what sort of level of uh, funding or resource allocation you will get. Now, it will be strict. It doesn't mean that you'll have to go and put uh, the names of the trees and the dogs and the pigs on the list of uh, the census. We need to make sure that they are properly identified facial, fingerprints, all these things must be documented so and updated every year by the wards and the districts and the provinces so that we can continue to allocate resources on a pay ahead basis right across the country, uh, give the funding directly. So we will then know how many jobs we are creating and, but I can tell you, as I said before, when we open up business confidence, when we open up foreign direct investment coming back into the country, when we cut back on the uh, inefficiencies in the government expenditure and expenditure on non-priority and redirecting them into infrastructure and the construction work that is going to go in building quality infrastructure right across the country, quality, building quality infrastructure for hospitals and schools and education and health facilities. And, and of course, uh, uh, building uh, the SMEs and the farmers and agriculture and tourism, uh, I, I can be very certain that 500,000 will be minimum. And I want to have this conversation in five years time and say, listen, did you deliver on this? And I can simply say that we will assess it by the data that census will collect over time and see who is employed and who is not employed uh, within that time. And it'll be an interesting study because 
we are, have got no statistical database which we are operating on. Everything what we do is we are estimating. So uh, the main thing is to get get this back back on track. And uh, uh, Philemon, uh, uh, that's a very interesting uh, question, uh, and I appreciate it. On the terms of um, in terms of uh, education, uh, uh, I, there's a uh, Duran Henry City uh, Sorry about the pronunciation, but your name is a bit hard to uh, hard to pronounce. But it says that uh, so keen to know if the free education policy, as well as free uh, scholarship scheme, uh, particularly for studying abroad, will be amended by uh, PNC party. Yes, we have made a commitment that free education will recommence, uh, and, and we will uh, recommence it uh, as soon as we introduce, if we are fortunate to form government, supplementary budget in, uh, in, in, in uh, September. We will relook at the budget and then and reprioritize our expenditure commitments, and free education will be one of them. Uh, we will reintroduce the National Scholarship Program. Uh, I am a beneficiary of a National Scholarship pro uh, Program, and I am, I am very thankful to the government then for providing such uh, scholarships to uh, most of us who came from rural uh, communities, uh, were enabling us to get the education that uh, we, we got to be uh, able to be uh, doing the jobs that we are doing today. Uh, this is very beneficial to people who, uh, uh, especially from low-income and in families. And I know that uh, Marape government has introduced a um, student loan scheme because this is happening in America and Australia. Well, let me tell you that it, it, it's not even working in America, it's not working in Australia. Because what it does is put these kids and these uh, young people who are starting their life into a, uh, a, a debt trap. Uh, uh, and exactly what the government is today, into just borrowing more and more to just stay afloat. We are not going to do that. We are going to give him a scholarship, we are going to give him subsidies, and we are going to make sure that uh, uh, we reintroduce the studies abroad, where we get the best and the brightest to go to some of the top universities around the world. We used to have students going to Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard, all these universities around the world, and today we hear none of them going there today, because our governments are not putting the resources and what we have got to do is give priority to, to uh, making sure that uh, we give the best opportunities for the brightest and the best. Uh, I know it's uh, a few more minutes left uh, for our talk but uh, I, I, I will uh, try my best to cover as much as I can. Uh, there is a question from uh, Timon James uh, particularly about uh, UBS inquiry which is a very interesting event that has taken place in our country recently. Uh, inquiries is gone. I don't, I've, I've had my say. I don't want to see, be seen as if I am trying to justify myself. I've stated very clearly. I've taken ownership of the decision. We've made a decision when we were in government as a government. Uh, unfortunately, some of my ministers at this time uh, uh, who did not object or who did not uh, uh, say that we were, don't want this particular transition to take place, uh, after uh, so almost uh, seven or eight years, uh, th they decide to change their mind and, uh, and make statements of uh, if they are earlier than the Oli. So uh, let, let the, uh, the Oli judge uh, them and uh, I, I will not judge them. But uh, let me say, we take full responsibility. They have thought that uh, uh, we have uh, done something wrong. The inquiry has not found that, that we have done something wrong, but uh, uh, said, states that we could have done it better uh, and, and that uh, the, the bank and the advisors that we got to advise us on these transactions have, done us, uh, uh, have not done us and acted on the best interest of our country and our people. Uh, and the losses that we have sustained is because of the, uh, the extra fees that they have charged. Uh, and this is where the government should go after them together with the Australian government. The Australian government are our friends. They will have to help us recover these funds that are coming back to come back into the country. Uh, again, it shows the weaknesses that we have in our, our system. When we have complex transactions like that, our officials are not capable of understanding it. And when they pretend to understand that they, they, they give us advice at the leadership level, we take this uh, advice for granted. But those are weaknesses that are there, and I accept full responsibility. 
uh, we're not going to blame anybody. We are going to go ahead and uh, take ownership of the inquiry and we will enforce, enforce the issues. Uh, the only issue that uh, they've brought against me is they said I've given some false evidence. Uh, this is because of a testimony of one person uh, who is uh, said that, that he saw me in a meeting. He was not part of that meeting, but he saw me in a meeting. Uh, whereas I, after eight years, I could not recall that meeting, and uh, I could not recall meeting that person that uh, was then. And that's the the inquiry's conclusion. And I know. Uh, there's a question by uh, uh, Ronald Moy saying that uh, it was in my time that we did not uh, reappoint this, uh, the then Chief Justice back to the position. Uh, that was a cabinet decision. Uh, of course, some, uh, some were against, some were foreign. Uh, but again, it was uh, based on the majority view. And, and decisions have been made. We accept full responsibility. Uh, it, on that basis, if I had gone to court to stop the inquiry, uh, people would have thought that I have got something to hide, so I did not object to his appointment. Uh, but I am disappointed with uh, uh, him believing a testimony of one person uh, to give a, a recommendation uh, that it, they have done. But I will test that in court, uh, and I look forward to uh, to doing that. But uh, listen, what has happened has happened. Reports there. Uh, uh, let's allow our agencies of government and officials to take 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 charge of it. Uh, we've uh, talked about the uh, economy. There's uh, there's a few views about how do you, how do you um, how is your government uh, going to reduce uh, the high debts we have got in the country? Well, firstly, we have to try and learn to live within our means. And uh, the only way we can reduce debt is cut expenditure. Uh, and non-priority expenditures that, you know, we won't have any cuts in health or education or law and order or infrastructure or the basic things that uh, run the country, we are not going to cut. Free education is not going to be cut. But some of the sweet art projects and some of the payments that have been made around the country, those are the ones that we are going to cut where it is got of no economic value or, or no service delivery to the nation. By those savings, we are able to bring the deficit back to an acceptable level. As I said, today it's uh, just over six billion kina a year. Uh, that's just far too high. We have to bring it back down to, in 2018, was it was 2.048 billion kina deficit. These are the official figures from Bank of Papua New Guinea IMF and the World Bank. These are not my figures that I'm quoting, so uh, if anybody has got issues with it, please check that. But we have to bring it back to 2,000 level, uh, to 2 billion level deficit and slowly bring it down. And we have committed to a balanced budget, meaning that our revenues must match our expenditure by 2027. If we get into government, that is the commitment we have made. And to reduce you know, there's a misconception out there that uh, when we talk about the uh, Physical Responsibility Act that was passed by um, uh, Bart Philemon, I think in 2009 or so, that he set a limit of the 30%. Well, if you read through the law, there's no such uh, limit of 30%. It was a uh, sort of a guiding principle that the government took, but it is not legislated. Uh, in fact, when we came into government, I think it was in 2012 or 11, uh, I think it was 2014, when we saw that debate of our debt issues were getting out of and we wanted to force ourselves to come down to uh, a, a fixed level of uh, debt, debt to GDP. So that's why our government put 35% debt to GDP. Uh, in practice, of 30% was done under the Samara government, but it was not legislated. The legislation was done by our government in 2014. Then, a few years ago, uh, I think last year, uh, the Marape government increased it up to 60%. So we are committed to bringing it down back to 35%, so we can live within our means. And if we have to legislate that into a constitution rather than a simple uh, law, uh, we will do that uh, in the coming uh, term of parliament. Uh, that way we force our leaders who are coming into government and who are, who are, who are going to lead us, uh, even doesn't matter when governments changes, uh, they are not going to put us into a, a huge debt situation as we are in today. 
So uh, I, I think uh, our policy is very clear and very uh, uh, strong in the sense that we want to have a balanced budget in 2027 and over the next five years we will reduce the debt levels down to 35% of GDP and, and lock it in there by possibly constitution. Uh, in terms of um, home ownership, as we said, we are going to try and build 5,000 homes per, per annum and not try. We will, we will uh, start from day one. Uh, as many of you know, uh, I'm uh, always keen on building infrastructure for our people and housing is uh, on the front of our agenda. And uh, if we give a quality housing, good uh, access to power and water and sanitation, you will see the standard of living and quality of uh, health and productivity of our people will increase. So uh, once again, thank you very much. We will be seeing you out in the, uh, in the, on the road. I look forward to engaging with you uh, uh, over the next, uh, next uh, few weeks. Uh, but to conclude, let me tell you this. Uh, this election is coming up, it's not about who becomes Prime Minister, it's not about one or two people. It's not about PNC or Pangu or National Alliance or any other party. Uh, it's about you, your family, your community and uh, your country. We need to make sure that our country gets uh, back on the right track of growth and prosperity, improving the quality of life and standard of living for our people, reducing the cost of living for our people, trying to make sure that our economy stabilizes, creates more jobs for our people. And, and that, that is what we need to, to, to try and do. Not try and do, we must do it. We have no choice. Uh, every year, our population is growing by 3%. That means on average about 300,000 new Papua New Guineans are born every year. And they will demand schooling, they will demand hospital services, they will demand the roads that they will be used. So every year when you're doubling that, uh, every five years, when you look at the, that's uh, another 1.5 million people, Papua New Guineans, that uh, are going to increase to the population. So it is not something that we have to, f we, we want to fall behind. We have to put our foot down and say, enough, let's get on to building the country and developing the country and, uh, and, and, and that we are all proud of. Our country is not poor. Our country has got enough resources, both in terms of uh, natural resources and resources in manpower. We've got some of the smartest people uh, in this country that can be part of this team to, to uh, grow the country and develop the country. We are asking you to join us at PNC. We've got a clear policy platform. Uh, I'm disappointed to see that uh, many of our other uh, party friends in our other parties are not clearly articulating their policies. They're developing policies on the run. As soon as they go to one rally, they have a different policy announcement. When they go to the next rally, they've got a different policy announcement. Uh, it's sad to say that, but they don't know what they're talking about. Uh, so uh, let's make the right choice and look forward to seeing you in the elections uh, and the campaign uh, over the next few weeks. God bless you, good night.